So in a previous video I showed you how to set up timer zero to produce uh, PW, PWM signals and then uh, I hooked them up hooked up an LED and a resistor to the PWM output and by varying the duty cycle of the PWM I got the brightness of the LED to change from full dark to full brightness and everything in between. Now um, as I explained in that video the um, LED is actually being turned on and off very quickly it's just that the amount of on time compared to the amount of off time which is called the duty cycle determines the brightness obviously the, the longer that it's on for that period of time the brighter it's going to be overall and our eyes act like a filter and um, they filter out the pulses and so the, the LED just looks like it's on continuously now, as I also mentioned in the video, the frequency at which it's being turned on and off, which is this TPWM here, is uh, 62.5 kilohertz, or 62,500 times per second. It's turning the LED on and off. Now, I can replace that LED with a resistor and a capacitor like this to create a, a filter, which is called a low-pass filter and um, we'll get a varying voltage here that we could do something with. Now we've got to pick these values of resistor and capacitor in order to get our what's called the cutoff frequency of our filter in the right spot. Um, if this voltage for example we want to vary it to give say a, a, a tone like a, um, a musical tone or something like that which is you know a, would be a, a couple of kilohertz, not very high compared to the 62 kilohertz of the PWM signal. So you've got to pick the um, the cutoff of the filter so that it's um, high enough to pass the tone that you want to have come out here, but but low enough to cut off the high frequency of of the PWM signal. And so uh, if you were to plot the output of this filter with respect to frequency. So frequency is across the bottom, the output of the filter is the vertical here, and the output remains pretty constant until the um, AC impedance of the capacitor gets close to the value of the resistor. And as the frequency increases, the impedance of the capacitor will get smaller and smaller. And so it'll start to draw this point down to ground, and eventually at a very high frequency, this capacitor looks almost like a short circuit and so you won't get any signal out here. And the breakover point here at this knee, once it's past that, then the um, output with frequency drops off at this very constant rate. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on how low-pass filters work with R's and C's and stuff. Uh, that could be a, a topic for another video. But um, the uh, formula for calculating this point here is um, 2 pi, 1 over 2 pi times the value of the resistor times the value of the capacitor. And so at this point here, the uh, AC impedance or AC resistance of the capacitor is the same as the DC resistance of the resistor. And so um, I will uh, now replace this diode with this RC circuit and show you what the output looks like on the scope. So here is the original PWM signal which is being fed into the LED or the the uh, filter, the RC filter. And then I'll just move the scope probe over to that point between the, the resistor and the capacitor. And we're going to see a messy looking signal here until I adjust the scope. Let's come around the other side here so I don't have to reach across. And I'll slow the time base way down and give it a moment to update. And there we go. So if I had an LED hooked up to it, this is what you would see. So suddenly the LED becomes bright and then it's gradually dimming right off to zero and then it pops up to being bright again and it gradually dims off to being zero. So that's the voltage output or the VO output that I had shown in my little schematic diagram here. Now um, how that's produced is the value being loaded into the output compare register starts off at 255 and every time every so often it gets changed, uh, it gets decremented in value and it goes down and down and down until it reaches zero and then it starts back up again at 255. So by putting in different values in here I can create any kind of a waveform that I want and um, 
I've re I'm going to rewrite the software for the uh, the uh, microcontroller, and I can get it a sinusoidal waveform to to uh, come out here on the screen. And so let's have a look at that. All right, now here's the uh, output of the PWM pin uh, with the code that's producing a sine wave, and uh, it's really hard to see because it's varying quite quickly. If we can get it to really show anything. If I do a single sweep, you get it still looks like PWM signal, but every time you take another sample, it'll be different because it's rapidly changing. So every PWM, so every time um, the PWM is going to change state, uh, a new value is written into the output compare register, and so this PWM um, on time will change uh, every time. And so it's really jittery. But if I were to move the scope probe over to the V out part between the R and the C and slow it way down, and we have a nice looking sine wave coming out of it. And we look at the frequency of the sine wave down here, and it's about 245 odd hertz. Um, now, how do we get that? Because our, our PWM frequency is. is uh, 62 and a half kilohertz. Well, there are 256 points of voltage between here and well actually between the halfway point and one complete cycle. So one complete cycle of the sine wave takes 256 different voltage points in order to create that. And so you divide the 62 kilohertz by 256 and I would imagine you would get this 245, let's just check it out here. Was it 62, 500 divided by 256 is, yeah, 244 hertz. So that makes sense there. Now I'll show you how that was done in the uh, code. All right, here we are in the software that generates the sine wave I just showed you on the oscilloscope using PWM. And the way I do it, I talked about 256 data points for the sine wave. Well, what I've done is created this sine table here, which has these discrete values. And if you look at them, you can see how they change. They go from uh, a maximum of 255 somewhere, here we are, um, down to zero, and then back up again. Starts actually at 128, it goes up to 255, down to zero, and then back up to 128. And that produces that sine wave on the screen. And so, um, and, and as I always, this code is available on my GitHub site. You can download it and play with it and see actually how it works. But I'll go through it fairly quickly here. So um, in our main subroutine here, in the main function here, we set up the timer zero with a fast PWM, just the same way we did it the last video I did on the PWM. So this is just a direct copy of the code. Um, I'm not using the output compare register B, so I'm not worried about the uh, port um, D5. We're just going to work with port D6. Um, so we um, have to make that port an output so that the PWM signal appears on it. This is setting up the timer uh, as previously. It's a, just a fast PWM. And here I enable the output compare interrupt enable, so register A. So when when the timer counter register matches the output compare register, it generates an interrupt. And what we do in that interrupt routine, which is up here now, instead of just setting a bit saying that the timer, because previously I used timer zero to create a, or uh, not timer zero, I used timer two actually, but you can use timer zero to do the same thing. But previously I used timer two and then its output compare uh, interrupt um, I used it to generate the 10 millisecond interrupter uh, and then it would set a flag only in this uh, interrupt service routine. But in this case here, what I'm doing is every time there's a match between the timer counter register and the output compare register, I go in and I change the value of that register so that the next time around it'll be a different value and it gives me a different output on the voltage. And so all I'm doing here is output compare register is given the value of sine table and this is the um, index into that table. And I declared the the uh, the index just i, 
and I declared it static, which what it means is that um, it will be remembered between interrupts. And so whatever the value of i is at the, when this interrupt finishes, it will be there the next time the interrupt is generated. If I didn't make this static, the value of i would be set to zero every time the interrupt started. And uh, it wouldn't be remembered from the last time. So you'd always just be outputting the first value in the register or in the sign table. So up here I've declared the sign table as an array of, well, I didn't tell, I didn't see how many uh, values are in it, but because I've declared it with all these values, the compiler just knows that it's going to be, if you count all these up, it would be 256 values in this register here. So it'll be an array of bytes, 256 bytes long, and byte 0 would have 128, byte 1 would have 131 in it, all the way down through to byte uh, 255 would, be, would have 124 in it. And so to access these bytes, you simply put a number into these square brackets here. Whatever that number is will be uh, corresponds to whatever number is in the array. And I increment this every time, and now it's an 8-bit uh, value. And so I can just continually increment it, because when it reaches 255 on the next incre increment, it will just go back to 0 again and start all over. So all it's doing is scanning through this. Each time there's an interrupt, it scans through and picks up the next value in this register, and then it hits the end here. And then on the next interrupt, it starts back over at, this, at the beginning again. So it just keeps cycling through this sign table every time there's an interrupt. And then that value gets put into the output compare register. So the next uh, PWM cycle, it will be a, a different uh, output compare value. And so that the uh, high time of the PWM signal will be uh, different each time. And each time it's different, it produces a different voltage at the V out pin that I showed you in my little schematic between the, the R and the C. And that's really all there is to it. Um, you have to enable the interrupts here and then you go into the while, the forever loop here. Remember I told you before that the microcontroller always has to be executing instructions until unless you've told it to go to sleep and I haven't told it to go to sleep in this case. So it's continually running, but in here it's doing nothing. It doesn't need to do anything because the interrupt routine is what's doing it all. Now the output of frequency of this signal is fixed. It's not going to change. Um, uh, this is just a very simple demonstration that I wanted to show you how to how to to uh, make a variable voltage using a PWM. If you wanted to generate different tones with this, you'd have to come up with a way of uh, varying the uh, time between the output compare registers updated. And obviously with 256 points in here, it produces a very nice smooth sine wave, but um, the maximum frequency we can generate with this method is, to, uh, what is it, uh, 245, roughly 245 hertz. If you wanted to generate a couple of kilohertz, which is possible with, with a microcontroller like this, you'd have to modify the size of the table, put in less points, because uh, you can't speed up the PWM uh, any faster. And also, um, at a 62.5 kilohertz interrupt rate, the microcontroller doesn't have a whole lot of time between interrupts to do very much of anything else. Uh, it works out to about 256 instructions between each interrupt. So um, it really can't do a whole lot. So there's, there, there are other, uh, better ways of producing this, but uh, um, it makes the code a lot more complex, and I'm not going to go into that right now. But what I wanted to do in this quick video is just to show you how to generate a varying voltage uh, using the PWM. It's actually pretty simple, and it's kind of neat how it works. So anyways, I hope you like this video. And um, if there's enough comments, I might uh, come up with a way of producing a way of varying the frequency um, where maybe you type in the frequency that you want and push the enter key and the, uh, the frequency would change to that value. Um, but again, like I said, this will be a much more complicated code. Anyways, hope you like this. Catch you the next time.